on oh three o'clock rock here on think tech today we're with ray tsuchiyama and of course we're talking about hawaii at the statehood and in, in specifically uh we're going to talk about the rise and fall of the japanese in hawaii uh, in in hawaiian history after statehood it's a very interesting subject welcome back thank you very much i, I don't want to say it's a rise and fall i think it's a rise and fall and continuance. Okay, in, 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 it's in, a secular. Yeah, I, I think it's still continuing. Uh, uh, as you know, there's uh, going to be 1.8, 1.9 million Japanese visitors to Hawaii uh, this year. So, and back in the late 90s, there were over 2 million, which was the height. So there's been a slight drop uh, from the early 2000s, but it's still, uh, when you talk about the uh, arrival of J Chinese tourism, it's barely 30, 40, or 50,000 a year. So uh, you're talking, you know, uh, just a small data point. Well, let's let's, let's yeah. talk about it from the time it first became an obvious phenomenon, which I believe would have been in the late 70s, um, early 80s, when the Japanese started coming right. in large numbers, right? That's correct. But uh, when, if you go so historically, uh, there were Japanese immigrants here of course. Uh, in the, in the 18, uh, uh, late 60s when the Meiji era began, 1870s, 1880s when King Kalakaua uh, uh, actually visited the Emperor of Japan and, and thought about uh, marrying off a princess and, and kind of binding Japan, yeah, good idea. the Japanese Empire and the Hawaiian Kingdom together yeah. there to protect uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom from uh, uh, another country called the United States. It so, didn't work. So, so there's been continuing immigration for the sugar plantations. My own grandparents arrived in 1907. And that's during the, uh, again, uh, during the Meiji era. And then my father was born in the Taisho era from about 1912, 13, that continues in the early 20s. And then, and then though, as you know, immigration stopped be, uh, just before uh, when Pearl Harbor occurred. And then it didn't really pick up. But you're correct that the early 80s is the key time for Japanese tourism. And there's several um, uh, factors to that, including the rise of the Japanese economy. People became middle class. They began to earn you know, income uh, and money to uh, be able to afford a trip on a plane to go overseas. That's number one. Number two, the Plaza Accords in, the, in uh, 83, 84 uh, uh, readjusted the yen, and suddenly from 360 yen to a dollar, which was there for since the end of World War II, it floated down to like 120 yen to a dollar. So uh, everything the became cheaper. The value of the yen was Yeah, more. 50%, 60%, 80% cheaper in, in, in Hawaii. Uh, they had third, more buying power. Uh, much more buying power. The third one that people don't realize is that the J Japanese government had strict controls on the yen uh, leaving Japan and on, even on passports. So people couldn't really travel outside Japan. They didn't have a passport. So all that combination of uh, you know the yen, the uh, Japan is number one. You remember that uh, book by Ezra Vogel of Harvard, and uh, Japanese management, Nissan, Toyota, Sony, all these brands coming out uh, that would be uh, people thought would last a thousand years uh, would uh, would provide the impetus for Japanese tourism to really uh, and, and investment to Hawaii. Yeah. So it probably, as in um, other, you know, other mm, phenomena like this, it started as tourism, and then they came. They liked what they saw. It was. It became more than tourism. You know, I want a piece of the rock. I want to stay here. I want to invest here. I want to buy property here. Uh, I want to live here. I want to get an immigrant visa, and whatnot. Uh, right. I mean, what what was the sequence there? Assume now we had this explosion in Japanese tourism, late seventies, early eighties. How did it? How did it get its legs and its feet down? Well, you have to go a little bit uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, mid late 60s, early 70s. There was a very early forays by Koksai Kogyo and, and Mr. Uh, Kenzi Osano. Oh, and, sure. And uh, remember that Bought name? Bought the Sheraton. That's right. It? Sheraton, Moana, Royal Hawaiian as a big package and so forth. And so that was a very early investment without Japanese tourists ever landing in, in Hawaii. So he, he saw the future coming uh, very clearly at that time. I've got to tell you a short story. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> he was coming to buy the Sheraton. And, you know, it was, it's warm in Hawaii relative to Japan. And he has a net shirt on. He has a T-shirt underneath and underwear. <laughs> and he has a net shirt on. And he's carrying the money, okay, to buy the hotel. Huge check. It was a cashier's check or something or a bank draft, okay. And the check was in a place that was safe. It was between the net shirt 
and, the, and I'm serious about this, the net shirt and the underwear, okay? I don't think he realized that you could actually see the check. <laughs> he was a diminutive guy, um, happened to be very successful, and this was a big deal, so he wore it in a safe place. And if you looked at him, if you looked at his shirt, you, I know people who had this experience, and you looked at his shirt, you would see, you would see the check. And, and it's kind of remarkable that that was the check that, that, that put, um, you know, uh, uh, Osama, what was his name? Osano. Osama, yes. uh, you know, that, that gave him the big start of Japanese investment in Waikiki. So that, well, that was a start before that, that great time. Uh, and, and, but the, the 80s were different, that um, it unleashed a lot of people who uh, made uh, people, meaning companies and, and entrepreneurs and, and, and people who did not come from the Hitachis, the Fujitsus, the Sumitomo Mitsubishis for the greater part. Although like Mitsui Real Estate made a great uh, project out of the Hale Kalani Hotel, for example, uh, and, and made it a global standard. But there were many, many others who came out of uh, their uh, holdings in real estate in Japan, which began, uh, really rose in value at that point. And and they used to say if you took that area where the Imperial Palace uh, um, is located in the middle of Tokyo, it was equivalent at that time to the, to the real estate value of the state of California. <laughs> Okay. So, so, so the you, prices were yeah, really that's high. That's right. So you could see that the Ginza and and you know areas in Shibuya, Shinjuku, shot, uh, rocketed in value. So they began to uh, borrow based on uh, on those properties. So and the banks were flush with money. Remember exports. Uh, the uh, major uh, uh, we forget about this, but the, but the major trade issue at that time was Japan. Yeah. You know, dumping their cars. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dumping their electronics. electronics yeah. yeah, dumping their electronics. Remember the Walkman. The, yeah, the, the Walkman. Walkman. Remember Everywhere the, in the world. last great electronics company was Motorola. They, when they sold uh, Quasar, they were still making TVs in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. When they sold that, that was the end of, of uh, you know, consumer electronics manufacturing in the U.S. Yeah. So uh, everything was going down. Cars, uh, ca uh, cars and quality, semiconductors. And remember, um, uh, Japan is number one. J Japanese management was how to do really great management also uh, of, of companies. And that's how they became global, uh, uh, you know, Sony's and, and uh, the Nissan, Toyota's and Matsushita, Panasonic. So yeah. you could see all kinds of things uh, driving, uh, you know, and, but the people who came to Hawaii as investors came from uh, Azabu Jidosho, remember that. You know, it's, a, it's a, a company that was in real estate and also sold luxury cars in, in Japan. Uh, there was a KM, Kokusai Motors. There was a taxi cab company. So again, these were companies that really didn't uh, know about going abroad, but they wanted to do it because they suddenly were flush with cash. And Hawaii was a good place. Hawaii, Hawaii spoke the language. Hawaii had a lot of Japanese people already. Uh, Hawaii had, um, had pleased a lot of tourists, and, and they wanted a piece of the rock. But what came first, though, Ray? Was it the businesses, you know, following tourism? Was it the businesses, or, or was it, um, you know, real property, residential and commercial? Uh, or was it all happening at the same time? I think it was simultaneous. Um, you had a lot of people looking at properties while they were on vacation, you know, in the, in the 80s. You had uh, all kinds of entrepreneurs and ideas. I remember ideas like senior citizens uh, living out, you know, uh, their time in Spain or in Hawaii, for mm -hmm. example. That was, a, or uh, um, or schools and and you know uh, private colleges uh, trying coming to, here, yeah, coming building, here, building, building facilities, yeah, build, yeah. building facilities yeah. and and teaching English and so forth. That was another big idea of the of and that the immigration period. laws allowed this, favored it. Yeah, yeah, and and there were a lot of still uh, Japanese students make up a, a large percentage of international students at UH and in. HPU and Shamanana, uh, that yep, still yep, continues, yep. that still, still continues. Right. Uh, uh, and at the same time, there was the ja, J, Japan Airlines, the uh, ANAs, the JTBs, HISs, uh, flourishing within Waikiki. And they began to recruit people in, uh, to sell uh, duty-free Japanese speakers. The 80s really drew and, and, and leveraged people who spoke Japanese in the community also. Japanese-speaking lawyers, Japanese-speaking uh, real estate attorneys, uh, restaurateurs, all kinds of people were involved with these investments. Uh, and there was, I, I think, simultaneous. And local people were going to Japan to try to facilitate right, all those oh, yeah, deals? Yeah. 
right. and be layering and layering of commissions and agents and brokers and whatnot to try to bring Japanese. So it's not like they did it all by themselves. They had a lot of local help. That's right. There was a, there was a creation of an ecosystem. Yeah. And there were a lot of people who spoke Japanese, uh, including my mother who worked in Waikiki in retail, uh, and, and uh, others who learned Japanese uh, at Japanese schools. Uh, and, and Japanese still continues as a, a subject uh, language in many, many DOE schools because um, uh, the parents of, of uh, these uh, children, who are mostly Filipino, Hawaiian, or Samoan, and so forth, uh, who work in Waikiki, tell their children if they l learn Japanese, they'll get ahead in Waikiki. Yeah. Yeah, and still kind of living back in those days. Oh, in but the that 80s. still continues. Remember, yeah. the numbers are still Japanese yeah. in, in Waikiki. Yeah. No, so, okay, so what we had, we, they were investing in real estate. Right. They were investing in business. And golf courses, right? Right, right. Huge, huge, huge investments uh, again, in uh, golf uh, courses. Uh, that, that, um, uh, the Sony Open, of course, uh, uh, you know, the sending back shots of wildlife, and that also uh, exploded on the scene. Sony was a significant part of it. The old man lived here. That's correct. Uh, he loved Hawaii, and yeah. uh, he had a, a couple places here uh, near Waikiki, and, and he, loved, he loved Hawaii. And uh, so... Um, it was uh, a symbol. Yes, and, and again, um, for people... Um, uh, like you say, uh, the, uh, there were many Japanese restaurants, people who spoke Japanese. And like, now, see, it is a place where, uh, unlike the neighbor islands, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about Waikiki, uh, that, uh, that if you got off the plane uh, at Honolulu Airport, and then you got into a taxi or a bus provided by a tour, uh, you know, tour uh, company like HIS or JTB. And then you're deposited at uh, your hotel, but there's a leader of your tour group, right? There's a little flag and so forth. And then all your, uh, you know, checking in is, uh, is, is taken care of, you're shown to a room. And then you go out, you can find Japanese ramen, you can find Japanese sushi, you can find people that dutifully speak Japanese. An island within the island. Yeah, you don't have to uh, 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 speak English. I mean, it's, an, uh, it's a Japanese-friendly Japanese place. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the neighbor islands are much more challenging. You get off the uh, a plane at Kahului or Lihui or uh, whatever, corner. you have to rent a car. Right? I mean, you have to rent a car. You don't have to go any place, you need a car. You, and you have to navigate your way to buy a ticket to a, a luau or you know, getting into a um, show or a restaurant. You have to call for uh, a reservation. It's much more difficult. And you know what so, else you have to do? I have to take a break. Okay. <laughs> That's Ray Tsuchiyama. We're talking about uh, Hawaii after statehood, uh, the rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall of the Japanese in Hawaii. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I host the show Center Stage on Think Tech Wednesdays at 2 p.m. And this is Crystal That's Quark. right. I'm Crystal, and I host Quark Talk on Tuesday mornings. <laughs> I like watching Donna's show. You do. <laughs> I like watching your show. I like watching your show because you talk about you're not afraid to really dive into issues that are important, and, and sometimes they're a little shocking. And you always bring us information that is sometimes the underbelly that we Ooh, need to know and we need to you. see. It's important. Well said. Well, I like yours because you can find any topic and any type of character, but you will find that source which brought them to the product of that creative process. And I thought that's like the most important thing is the process. Awesome. Right? I think, yeah, I do. I think it's all about the process, and I think we'll find world peace when we know each other's stories. So thank you very much for bringing that to us. Join thank us you. on Think Tech. Uh, think Tech. Hawaii, anytime. Okay, we <laughs> came back. Ray Tsuchiyama and me were talking about Hawaii after statehood. Uh, the rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall. Mm -hmm. The Japanese in Hawaii in recent years, that's uh, so interesting. And oh, this, this is what we're talking, we're dwelling in the 80s here. The 80s are what? 30 years ago, 35 years ago, it's not that long, and yet people don't know. Uh, people now don't right. know what happened then. So, uh, they, you know, they had uh, a profound effect on tourism, the industry of tourism as we now know it. I think they drove it, really. There was no other group, not even the Canadians, that, you know, that were that uh, numerous and influential. Um, they changed the way things worked in Waikiki. 
No, I, I think um, if you talk about uh, Japan and Japanese society, um, one of the keys to uh, how they do business or, or uh, product development and innovation is through quality control. And uh, so a lot of tourists would, would you know, uh, pick up faults or flaws or this could be done better throughout the hotel industry. So I think a lot of Japanese innovations came in terms of you know, uh, uh, raising uh, um, standards uh, for service, customer service uh, in uh, Waikiki. And that meant hiring Japanese nationals to uh, staff the hotels. Yeah, the there hotels. were some of them, but again, uh, there were some who uh, went to Japan and learned the language and came back. Uh, you know, I remember uh, talking to uh, Dr. Kelly, Richard Kelly Outrigger. He used to go and you know pass out brochures on Outrigger, and he was a great marketeer for Hawaii uh, in Japan uh, a, a lot. So um, th there was, um, I think, a um, uh, awakening within the industry to really market more in Japan. Uh, and and uh, remember, before the Japanese came, it was a uh, it was a mostly West Coast mainland yeah, California. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it was a lower lower level, uh, you know, uh, per room um, pricing uh, uh, world, infrastructure, hotels in, in Waikiki. When the Japanese started to come, uh, there was a rise in, in, uh, in hotel, uh, you know, pricing, uh, luxury, more luxury hotels, the Trump Towers and, you know, uh, the rich towers would come in as condos, uh, the Hiltons and so forth. Sure, and uh, the same uh, in retail. You know, uh, the Palm Court kind of stores, you know, the Fifth Avenue stores right. came out here Correct. in order yes. to satisfy that same need for excellence, for expensive, for show-off kind, trophy, trophy That's type right. of goods. And, and so that was a major change within uh, Waikiki retail because uh, you could make uh, so much more money per square foot if you sold one, you know, a Louis Vuitton bag than, you know, 15 hamburgers in an hour. So that, that transformed the Waikiki retail uh, world very much. And, and also, I just wanted to point out that uh, in, in Ala Moana, there's a little bus terminal. And it's an uh, interesting uh, um, uh, development that you see many uh, buses, uh, Lea, Lea, Oli, Oli, you know, that you can only board if you have a JTB card or you know, some card, Japanese card. Now, there, this is a, pr a Japanese private kind of alternative mass transit system that they developed right here to, existing yeah, within to, the city yeah, to re, to solve one intractable problem which is how to get P japanese easily from waikiki to alamona even today in the mass transit world the bus is most heavily uh, 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 you know, uh, passenger uh, route is Waikiki Alamoana. Now, and, and then of course there's... Uh, there's they they uh, came to go to Alamoana. Yeah. Alamoana is the most important That's right. part and, of and, their and, trip. And, and also um, uh, the other uh, route is the airport. Now, it's interesting to point out that um, uh, there's several what-ifs, what-ifs in, in the history of Japanese uh, investments in, uh, in uh, Hawaii. And what if in the, in the 80s, and there was many people who came out to discuss with uh, the city administration to build uh, um, a, a mass transit line for free in order to get the you know development rights on the station. Actually, a good idea. Yeah, so that, that would have <laughs> if that had started earlier, I think that and and they would have started out between the first leg Waikiki and they would have invested uh, a lot in more. Yeah, they would have invested at that time. That never developed, unfortunately. The other thing that uh, should have developed by now, uh, through many many uh, turns in, in in this, is the. Um, Mid-Pacific, Japan, U.S. R&D center. Why hasn't that developed? I don't. Never got uh, again, the uh, there were many, many attempts at this. Through also, picture, attempts uh, many at, at setting up uh, medical facilities that uh, where again, Japanese could come and get yeah. medical care they wanted here. That that we we're going to be the um, you know the, the special medical center of the Pacific. That's that called medical happen. tourism. Again, uh, uh, Bangkok, Singapore, others are really. Uh, 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 in, in the forefront of that, yeah. that uh, category. But you're right, that's another area that uh, 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 if you were back in the 80s, you could have seen the, the colleges, but there is Tokai International uh, College in, in, uh, in EVA that's yeah. adjacent to West Oahu, and they're yeah. doing quite well there. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and they're a kind of like a symbiotic uh, And they're partner. not the only one of those Japanese colleges. But you know, what, what strikes me is, uh, just a, a, a footnote of all of this, is that we were faced, the state was faced with this enormous rush of people and uh, spending and demands for service and goods and, and for um, in investment. They wanted right. to invest big time. And uh, we, I don't think we saw 
the need, the importance of trying to manage this. I think it washed over us and then it washed back again. But I'd like to, before we go too much further, I want to talk about real estate. Okay. Because somewhere in here, they started buying real estate. Right. And first it was, you know, uh, it, was, it was random condos, and then it was, you know, large buildings and commercial and office. Uh, and then they were starting to develop buildings, right. Right. develop their own condos, which they could market in turn to Japanese investors. So, I mean, this happened at an alarming rate. There was so much going on in the late 80s. And... Um, by the early 90s, uh, all of this had pumped up real estate values in Hawaii because they were willing to pay trophy properties for everything. There was a story about a golf course. I forget the name, but it was a world-famous golf course in California. Pebble, Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach, yeah. where the place was worth, say, $50 million. But the law American lawyers representing the Japanese investors said, you know, you want to be sure to get it, you know, uh, offer $80 million. And they did, and they got it for $80 million. Next thing you know, they had to sell it because it was worth less than $50 million. But it was always seeking this kind of a trophy property at a trophy price. This had, in my view, a traumatic effect on Hawaii's real estate market uh, and its um, you know, economy and the benefit, the social, the social structure of the state because you, you were infusing all this money and ultimately investors want a return. If they don't get a return, it collapses. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, we, and before the show, uh, we were talking about other um, foreign entities that come in to, like Miami from uh, South America, Brazil, uh, uh, very similar stories are happening. Vancouver and the Chinese now, uh, probably, and of course, New York City has had waves of people coming from Europe or Asia and so forth. And, but I have to say a fundamental uh, issue here, uh, as, a, as a state or as a city, uh, how does one in a democratic society and economy, a free wielding capitalist economy, uh, manage uh, investment? So, for example, if from tomorrow we say Californians who come in here have to build affordable housing to do that some extent, or Colorado. That's or, unconstitutional. Yeah, you, you can't say but that. It, it is, uh, or, I think or, you can do something when you're talking about investment offshore, I mean, out of the country. Well, uh, Vancouver has done something uh, very dramatic. They've uh, instituted a foreigner's tax on, on real estate to control or manage this, uh, uh, this boom that they have in Vancouver. And so um, I think we have to be very careful of saying, and, and that's, and, and back in the um, early 90s, I think the mayor at that time, Mayor Fossey, actually said, we have to put a stop on that. And suddenly there was a kind of a, a slowing uh, uh, in the mid 90s. They wanted to buy a golf course. He wanted a $100 million <laughs> entitlement fee. Well, uh, uh, and, and that was really too high, but it showed you where his head was at. It was into managing what they did. And, and so um, uh, they can, people can always take their money and go other places. So that's, the, that's the point of uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm saying. That they uh, uh, saw Hawaii as a very, like you say, an inviting place, a, a place, a comfortable place, and a place that they could do business, and, and that uh, it was a really nice place to be because they were surrounded by people whom uh, they, they believed, the Japanese believed, uh, that, that they were doing a good thing for the economy. And they still believe that. And they came with that, you're talking about their management style, which was already tested world class, you know, with the consensus. I remember on Bishop Street here, they would walk around in their suits uh, in groups of five or ten <laughs> right, of them. Right. Uh, and they would, everything was consensus. Nobody ever actually agreed without talking to the group and having multiple meetings and conversations and asking you the same questions over and over and over again until everybody in the consensus group was satisfied. It was, we hadn't seen that before. Right. That was not American right. style. It was their style. It was very effective, I think, because it, you know, everybody tested uh, both internally and, and uh, externally on what was really going on and they learned how to deal with it problem is that they were willing to pay too much and uh, you know that led ultimately to a sort of inflation of real estate values which we the local people had to catch up with right because all of a sudden uh, it cost you know twice as much to buy a residence then you had to pay the twice as much because everybody was relying on comparables of properties that they purchased this had a big effect on things and when we come back which I hope will be soon, Ray. I'd like to talk to you about how it got to be a bubble and how the Japanese decided they got to leave town, the investors anyway, 
uh, and and how that all worked out because that was that was a hard time. This was roughly mm, 1993, uh, and I want to examine with you how it led up to that, what happened, and how 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 the the waves receded in the early 90s. What do you think? Well, that's fine. And of course, 91 uh, began the Iraq war, which would be the beginning of a 10-year recession. Yeah. And then uh, by uh, 2002, uh, things began to get better for Hawaii. And that would, you know... Uh, so it was a 10-year uh, period. That's right. Uh, and, and the Japanese figured in that period. Uh, but, uh, but what s uh, would come uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, would be uh, waves of American uh, tourists because of an internet bubble yes, happening in California. Yes, yes. And that would save Hawaii why, as the Japanese left, there will be another bubble coming coming in yeah. the early 2000s. Waves from all sides. And, and that, 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 again, uh, changed uh, the economy. And, and uh, we're, we're at this point where um, we're still waiting for the next <laughs> wave, but that sustained us for a as while. As we close, I just want to tell you one short story, and that is about a particular client of mine who had been part of one of those consensus group management groups and bought a lot of property here. And there came a time when they were folding up their last property, selling it off, and leaving town. I said, you're leaving. You're all leaving. We, we have worked with you for years now. You've bought a lot of property, done a lot of things here. But will you, do you see a time when you will come back? And he said to me, I'll never ever forget this. He said, no, I'm not coming back. My generation has failed to make the return that was expected of us by our principals in Japan. I will not be coming back. The next generation will come back, such as it is. Oh, and I thought it was a yeah. very wise statement. Thank you, Ray Tsuchiyama. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. <laughs> Hawaii after statehood. Wow, there's so much here. And there's more to come. More, <laughs> more to come. come. But it's very complex. It's not simple. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs>